Hello everyone. I hope that all of you are fine and enjoying good health. I welcome you to another lecture of robotics and automation. Uh, in this lecture, we shall talk about C space topology and representation. And then we shall also study about task space and workspace. So before beginning the lecture, uh, let's revise a little bit about from the previous lecture what we studied. In the previous lecture, we talked about uh, configuration space or C space. And also we, um, we talked about the degrees of freedom of the robot and how we can calculate degrees of freedom using Grubler's formula. Um, so we, we did a couple of examples there and one of uh, one of student contacted me and he asked me about uh, a specific case it's actually in chapter 2 the example is 2.5 so in this example he asked me about a specific case where we have to calculate the degrees of freedom of a mechanism and the mechanism look like something like this let me draw it here it was a fixed link here and then you have a joint a revolute joint and this revolute joint was connected with a link and there was another revolute joint it was again connected by a link and then there was another revolute joint and the other link was something look like something like this so yeah so then there we have another revolute joint here and here we have a link that goes like this in this direction and then again one revolute joint here and this revolute joint was connected with another link and finally it was connected with the ground from here we have a damper and this damper is connected to also to the ground so so now the task is to to tell how many uh, to actually find the degrees of freedom of this mechanism but the important thing here is that you need to find the uh, number of joints here so normally if you count um, how many joints we have here this is let's say starting from here this is a revolute joint so I call it R1 this is again a revolute joint I call it R2 and then here we have R3 and here we have R4 and then we have R5 okay here so this link here so you see that with this revolute joint we have two connected links one is going to the this damper and second is a normal link so here actually um, there are actually two two joints here two revolute joints and behind this uh, this revol this circle there is one more circle so because this is a 2d figure it's not clear here but if you look on uh, in a 3d so it should look something like this so there is one revolute joint here and then you have one more revolute joint something like this and this is then this is your axis so this is R4 this is R R5 so R we write R4 and R5 here so because there are two revolute joints here back to back and then we have here R6 R7 R8 
and this is a prismatic joint because it can only move in a linear fashion so we call it L1 so in total we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so just call let's call it L9 so total we have here nine joints in which we have eight revolute joints and one prismatic joint and if you if we talk about the links so here we have one link is this ground because this is also connected to ground connected to ground and here also connected to ground so we have one link which is a ground link we call it uh, l1 and then we have this one l2 l3 and this one l4 l5 and then this one is l6 l7 l8 so we have here almost eight links so here we have links so we call it n is equal to 8 and then we have joints j is equal to 9 so now you just have to use this uh, Grubler's formula to calculate the degrees of freedom of this mechanism so if this is clear then let's move forward and begin with our today's lecture so as I said earlier that today's lecture is about configuration space topology and representation so <clears throat> so first if you remember try to remember what was configuration and what was a configuration space so configuration from the second lecture we know that configuration is a specification of position of all joints so if you specify the position of of the all joints of the robot then this is the configuration for example this robot we call it theta 1 is equal to 45 theta 2 is equal to 45 then this is a configuration and if we uh, write all the specifications all the configurations then it will become a configuration space where theta 1 and theta 2 has all possible values okay so if you so that you can you can say it like configuration is an n-dimensional space containing all possible configurations so now we know that what is a configuration so topology configuration C space topology is just like a shape of the configuration space so topology we can uh, call it as a shape of the of your C space so here we can write C space okay so let's see an example of a point on a plane XY plane and let's see how we can uh, describe its topology so a point when it is on a plane let's say point x y plane so it can be described by two motions one is along x axis and one is along y axis okay so so it has two degrees of freedom this point and its topology is a rectangular space so this shape this rectangular shape we call it topology topology of C space for point P in plane okay so it means that we know now that whenever there's a point and it's a 2d 
2D point okay so it means its uh, C space will look like something like a rectangle now let's see how a topology of a point on a sphere looks like so a sphere is like a ball a balloon you can call it ball and it's round in shape here I cannot draw the 3d version but I can it looks like a circle 2d circle but it's imagine it as a 3d ball where to make it 3d I make it like something like this I draw some lines so it looks like a 3d ball okay so let's imagine a point here on this ball and this point P so although this object itself is a 3d ball 3d object but when you specify a point on its surface then it's a 2d actually a 2d surface and we call these lines as latitude and longitude latitude and longitude so these lines that describes the coordinates of this point we call it latitude and longitude we cannot call it x y because they are not that uh, rectangular they're not straight they're curved so for that we have to describe a different coordinate system and we take a latitude and longitude like we do it on our earth because earth is a spherical object and when we are on a surface we have latitude and longitude so similarly we have a point on a on a ball and we can describe its position using latitude and longitude coordinates so it means that its topology the C space topology will look like sphere um, is it a sphere or just wait a minute so yes um, we can write down we can write down there the C space topology of a point on a sphere is a spherical surface and we can represent this by s power 2 and this one here we can represent it using because this is um, Euclidean space we can call is we can write it as e power 2 this rectangular uh, surface we can we can represent it e power 2 it is Euclidean okay and for a spherical surface we can write it as s power 2 <clears throat> so yeah so this is how the shape of a, uh, of the C space of a spherical point will look like a point on a sphere on a sphere will look like just a sphere okay next we have um, both plane and sphere are 2d but their shapes are different so here we need a little bit change it's it should be like the sphere the plane sorry the plane and the sphere surface 
are 2D but their shapes are different. So now this is a proper wording we can use. So we have seen that a plane, a, pl a 2D plane this is clear that this is 2D because if it has only two coordinates y and x and on the other hand a, a surface of sphere if you if you see that this can also be described by two coordinates which are the horizontal and vertical lines latitude and longitude So this is also a 2D. Uh, this is also a 2D surface. So they both are 2D, but their shapes are different. So this is an important thing to notice because in later, uh, in upcoming complex topologies of the sea space, you will. This is an important thing to learn that two two sea space two C spaces they can have same number of dimensions but their topology can be different so this thing we will discuss in our next point which says that two spaces are topo topologically equivalent if one can be continuously deformed into other without cutting or pasting so this is the same point that we have discussed here that they are they are both 2d but they have different topology so we can conclude that two c spaces we can call them topologically equivalent if one can be continuously deformed into other without cutting or pasting for example if we can let's say we have a ball Oh, we have sorry we have a spherical um, we have a spherical uh, sea space okay let's draw it a little bit neater so we have a spherical sea space topology yeah it looks much much better So what we can do, we can um, we can a little bit distort it, compress it, and then it will look like something like, for example, this maybe. So if you if you press this circle from the left side, maybe it looks it, it, it gets squeezed and look like this. But still, these two uh, topologies, one and topology two so this is also c space so these two they are equivalent we can call them they are equivalent why because they can be transformed into one another without cutting or pasting you just uh, press this one from the left side or any other and it will look like this if you again uh, make it like uh, from here uncompress it or decompress it it will look like a circle again or a sphere again so these we can call them these two um, topologies of the sea space they are equivalent now let's see the example of a plane so we have a plane here 
a 2D plane. Planar C space. So here, can we convert this sphere into this 2D plane? Is there any way that we can do that? Just keep in mind that this is not a this is not a circle, okay? This is a sphere. This is a ball. And can we convert a ball into a plane into a paper, like straight, like a 2D paper? Have you seen this map, a global map? So can you convert this a three uh, a spherical global map into a planar sheet? without cutting or pasting? The answer is no, you cannot. So you cannot convert this topology into this kind of topology of the C-space. So we can call it that these two topologies are not equivalent. So we can call it that topology 1 and 2, they are equivalent, but topology 1 and 3, they are not equivalent. So, so if, we, if I have to convert a ball into a sheet, I have to, of course, I have to cut it and then I can make this shape out of a, of, out of a ball, like a rectangle. Without cutting, it's not possible. So I hope that this is clear. Um, anyways, if you have, um, if you want to go more detail on this, and you have set, you have any, you more, you want more literature on this, you can consult the book Modern Robotics, and the chapter is chapter two. Okay, so the next point is sphere and plane are not okay. Yeah, we have already discussed this thing. So, so the end result is sphere and plane are not topologically equivalent. Okay. So yeah, let's move to our next slide and. The circle is written mathematically as S or S power 1. So S means uh, square, so sorry, sphere, and 1 is one dimensional sphere. So this is the this is the topology and you can represent it as power 1 or you can also write it as one dimensional sphere which is a circle actually So similarly, the line is written mathematically as, so how can we write it? We can write it as E or E power 1. It can also be written as R or r power 1 so which is actually uh, one dimensional euclidean space
r power 1. So now you started to realize that how uh, a two dimensional will look like if, if there are two dimensional space how it will look like so let's see how we can mathematically write a sphere we already seen it before so let's see one more time so the sphere can be we can write them as s power 2 okay which means that which means a 2D surface in a 3D space. So th that is true because a sphere is actually a 3D surface, okay? So if you write, if you draw here, so let's say draw a shape, make a shape, let's say. So we have a sphere, let's say here, and so any point on this sphere, let's say uh, we call latitude and longitude, we have a P. So it means that this is actually this is if this is a 3D surface, okay? So it can be shown as a 2D a 3D sphere can be shown as a 2D uh, surface like we do it on our Earth. Okay, we have latitude and longitude coordinates. So this P can be represented as a 2D surface. Because we are here, we are ignoring the, the depth or the height information. We are only taking the surface. We, are, we say that the point is, uh, can only be on the surface of this ball. And so that's why we are only using the latitude and longitude and longitude coordinates okay so this is if this is clear then we can move you can now see that how n dimensional space is written so so the n dimensional space if it this is a uh, um, not uh, uh, spherical or circular space then it can be written as r power n this means the space must be Euclidean and n dimensional r power n it means for the line it it is r power 1 and for uh, uh, for a uh, rectangle for a rectangle we have here r power 2 for c space of rectangle Or better to call it rectangular A rectangular C space topology so similarly if you have a 3d then you can write it here r power 3 now this is only for Euclidean like not uh, some kind of where you have straight lines okay always straight lines and uh, not like uh, curved lines not a sphere like this in this case 
the n dimensional space can be written as s power n but for if you have straight lines then it's Euclidean space okay so now let's see that topology of a space is a fundamental property of the space itself and is independent of how we choose the coordinates to represent points in the space So let's see an example of two configuration spaces. One is a rectangular or a planar space. And the other one is the spherical C space. Planar 2D C space topology and this is spherical two D C space topology. So the, this statement says that the topology of the C-space uh, is independent on, in, independent from the coordinates that you select to represent the C-space. For example, here you selected, let's say, uh, y and x coordinate to represent this C-space topology, and here you represent, let's say, uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, latitude and longitude so the thing is the shape of this C space the spherical and this planar it has nothing to do with the coordinates that you choose okay you can for example you can choose here for this spherical workspace also you can choose the XY coordinates to represent this uh, this C space also okay the an example is for example on the earth surface when we move sometimes we use this GPS coordinates X uh, latitude and longitude to to define the position of the of a point or a person okay and sometimes we we also use XY coordinates to to define the position we can measure the length in in, in meters and then yeah so the main idea is that shape has nothing to do with the coordinates coordinates you can choose any coordinates but this the shape of the C space or the topology of the C space this is the fundamental or the basic and independent property of each and every C space So if this is clear, then we shall move to our next slide in which we study about how we can uh, show the C spaces as Cartesian products. So the C space of a rigid body in a plane can be written as, so previously we were talking about the we were talking about the point but now we talk about a rigid body actually so let's see how we can represent it as a Cartesian product so if a rigid body is in a plane it means it will look like something like this the this is a plane And here we have a rigid body, let's say. So this is our rigid body. It 
and here we have 2D plane so to represent it of course we can use to describe its configuration what we need we need um, actually for position we need x and y axis and for the orientation of this body we need angle theta so this is its configuration can be described by these three coordinates and this configuration space will look like 2d plane and we can also represent the c space uh, as its as the cartesian product so if we want to write down uh, a cartesian product as a this c space as a cartesian product so we can write it as r2 r power 2 cross s power 1 so because in the previous slide we studied that the the uh, the rectangular c space can be represented as euclidean uh, or r power 2 okay and the rotation of the circular space can be represented as s power 1 so this is where it comes from so either you can write this here or you can also write this here so it will be as Cartesian product so here you can see that one is the r represent the euclidean the straight line lines and s is the circular lines that means in this configuration we have two uh, linear motions and one circular motion okay now let's see how we can represent the c space of a pr robot as a cartesian product so <clears throat> so what is a pr robot uh, it is a robotic arm or a link which has a one prismatic joint and one revolute joint okay so you can think of it as a something like this where you have a revolute joint and then here you have a prismatic joint so this is a revolute joint this is prismatic joint okay so now its configuration can be written as of course this is one it has one linear motion x let's say this is x here and the rotation is theta so its configuration space is x and theta which can be represented as a cartesian product for x for x it is r power 1 okay cross for theta it is s power 1 so this is how you can represent the pr robot as a cartesian product so now let's see how we can represent a 2r robot as a cartesian product so for a 2r robot let's run pr robot and here we have C space as a Cartesian product. So now let we we shall do same for our two R robot. So for our two R robot we have here a fixed link here, and then a revolute joint, and then we have a link, and then we have again a revolute joint and a second link here. So that is why it's called. 2R 
planar robotic arm okay so here you can see that we have one revolute joint we call it theta 1 and we have one more another revolute joint we call it theta 2 so the configuration of this robot robotic arm can be described as by theta 1 and theta 2 angles which can be represented as a Cartesian product of S1 cross S1 because they are both angles and angular motion is actually a circular motion which we have already studied that it can be represented as a one dimensional sphere so S so and this can also be written as this can also be written as a torus T power 2 so T where T is the T is the torus and you know how the torus looks like it looks like something like this like a donut So this is how a torus will looks like so this is the uh, this will be your C space for the torus so the C space of this it means the this 2R robotic arm will look like this so it's a torus and for for your PR robot it's it, it can be represented as uh, this uh, this Cartesian product here okay now we have already seen the how we can represent the C space as Cartesian products and it's quite easy because you have to just combine the basic uh, representation of the of your configuration and then you just have to add a cross in between and then it's a complete representation of your of your rigid body okay moving forward quickly and we shall see another example here and the uh, example is Um, the example shows that how the uh, configuration topology or the shape of the different things looks like so from the first is let's start with a point on a plane 2d surface how its um, topology will look like okay of course it can be represented can be represented as 2d represented by two coordinates which are X and Y so the topology will look like a rectangle like this where we have X and Y axis and you can also represent it as E power 2 or R power 2 okay so we are talking about a point any this point here P point so of course if this is a rigid body as we have already discussed then it will be a Cartesian product it will be also S power 1 okay and depending upon the dimension of the rigid body so 
the second is let's take an example of a spherical pendulum a spherical pendulum um, can be represented by two coordinates and these coordinates are latitude and longitude so first what is a spherical pendulum a spherical pendulum is a pendulum that that can uh, that has a one link and it can it has a it's uh, fixed at the center but it the the other end can rotate on a sphere or on the surface of a ball like or a sphere so this point it can it can move on the surface of this this ball this uh, sphere okay so this point P and it can move along either the uh, latitude or also it can move along the language longitude here so so this point can be represented by latitude and longitude and how we can represent it how it's uh, C space topology will look like so it's C space topology will look like something like a sphere okay I make it like this so it looks like a sphere and it can be represented by s power 2 because it's a sphere it's not a circle now let's take an, an, another example where we have uh, where we have to we have a 2R robot so we can say that the C space topology of a 2R robot robotic arm can be represented by two coordinates which are theta 1 and theta 2 so here we have a 2R robot theta 1 theta 2 for the second joint and as we already have um, described in the previous slide that it's it can be represented as the as a torus okay which is T which can be further be the shape of the actually the shape shape of the uh, your C space or this topology shape will be something like this and this is because this is your robotic arm and this is the link one here L1 L2 so theta 1 theta 2 so you have theta 1 here
okay it means when your link one moves so your robot moves like this it can it can reach here okay in these configurations and let me draw like this so it means this area is Uh, so it means that we um, the shape of your top, uh, of the C space will look like this, okay? And why it looks like this specifically? Uh, because we have your first angle theta one, okay? Theta one will be this angle from starting from here from zero. Okay, let me draw zero from here starting from zero till 360 you have a whole theta one angle okay and then you have angle two which is theta two so theta two is located theta two is measured uh, this angle theta two which is the surface of this tube here okay so you can consider this as a pipe a round pipe here and but this pipe is also in a circle you can consider it as a pipe which is hollow from inside and this pipe is uh, is in a circle okay so one surface is the surface of this pipe is represented by theta 2 okay and the uh, location of any point on on the surface is represented by theta 1 for actually for more examples if you if you need more examples about the configuration about C space topology refer to the book modern robotics and the section is 2.2 sorry not the section is a table the table is okay there you will you you will see the more clear 3d examples of the uh, sea space topology of different types of mechanisms and robots okay so let's move forward and now we shall talk about configuration space representation so previously till now we were talking talking about the sea space topology its its shape how it looks like okay but from now we shall also learn what is how we can represent the sea space or the configuration space okay so to perform computations a numerical representation of the space with the real numbers is required okay previously we were only talking about the shape rectangular or circular or torus or spherical but for actually for mathematical calculations or equations uh, there we need um, mathematical representation of your C space not the shape okay to represent a plane we choose a reference frame with origin point and two orthogonal coordinate axes so how we can represent the plane here First, arrange them a little bit here. Uh, 
Okay, so now how we can represent a plane, the representation of a plane as it's mentioned here. We can choose an origin point, a reference frame, and two orthogonal coordinate axes. So this will be a reference point here. Let's say this is we have a plane here. Or a planar workspace so what we do we choose here a reference point here let's say this is 0 0 and then we say okay in this side we have the x-axis and on on the orthogonal side perpendicular to this it's the y-axis we have here so this is how we represent a, a plane or any point in a plane which will which is r power 2 so this is how we represent the plane and the next point it says that topology of the space is independent of the representation of the space so we already discussed this point we said that okay if we have a rectangular C space topology and then we have a spherical C, C, C space topology so it means that uh, this topology is not dependent upon the representation representation means its coordinates so this topology is not dependent upon the its representation let's say if we represent this this by uh, this plane by uh, x and y and we represent this uh, spherical c space by two coordinates which are uh, let's say for this point it's latitude and longitude here so So actually we we can represent this spherical C space using X Y coordinates also so yeah so it means that it's not dependent upon the um, on the representation topology and its representation they are independent of each other this is a shape and this is the its uh, mathematical form you can say of the C space okay and they are actually independent of each other so next point is if a space is flat Euclidean then we choose Cartesian coordinates to represent the space so usually we use um, Euclidean or Cartesian coordinates when the space is flat. For example, if we have a rectangular C space or you can call it planar. We have a planar C space so what we do we usually represent them using Cartesian coordinates because they are straight okay so I've got long x-axis they are straight and along y-axis they are straight and if the space space is spherical and the lines are not flat they are actually curved so usually we represent them using angles which is latitude and longitude
So this is how we represent the uh, a C space or a configuration space. Okay, let's move quickly to the next slide where we have it says that we if the space is curved sphere then we can either use explicit parameterization which uses minimum number of coordinates such as latitude longitude we can also use implicit representation which uses more coordinates subjected to constraints so in the previous slide we said that we can uh, we can use uh, latitude longitude for a spherical representation of a C space so but it can also be either we can use also explicit parameterization so this latitude longitude representation of a spherical C space is it's called explicit parameterization okay so this uses a minimum number of coordinates we can also use implicit representation which uses one or more coordinates subjected to constraints so for implicit representation there are constraints involved one at least one or more coordinates the coordinate is constrained okay that's why it's called implicit representation okay now let's go in a little bit further and let's see what is implicit representation the explicit rep representation this is easier to understand in which we use minimum number of coordinates and these are latitude and longitude okay these are horizontal and vertical lines as we discussed in the previous slide but for implicit representation of a sphere considered 2d surface embedded in a 3d Euclidean space okay we use three Euclidean coordinates x y z subjected to constant radius constraint which is x square plus y square plus z square is equal to 1 so this is how we use implicit representation there are two methods so let's okay let's draw here the uh, explicit uh, implicit representation of a uh, point so let's say we here we have a coordinates x y and z so this is the x coordinate this is the let's say y coordinate and z coordinate here and then we have here a uh, A spherical C space okay it's a sphere it's not a circle but it's a 3d sphere it's a ball here so let me write down here it's a so this one is a spherical C space and these are our three coordinates like normal um, Cartesian coordinates that we use for the representation of actually a planar or Euclidean C spaces okay but as I mentioned earlier these coordinates Cartesian coordinates can also be used for the representation of the spherical uh, C spaces also so let's see how what we do we have three coordinates here and we have a constraint here which says that a constraint says that uh, x square plus y square plus z square is equal to 1 so this is a constraint it means that the sum of all these should be equal to 1 okay so this is a constraint we have
and it means that that any point on this sphere let's say a point P which is on this sphere uh, it can how many degrees it can have the degree of freedom of point P is equal to uh, total uh, freedoms of the point minus constraints so if you minus total freedoms a point in a 3d uh, space how many freedoms it will have three degrees of freedom and how many constraints it have one constraint so total degrees of freedom will be two okay so this point can have two degrees of freedom it means that on this uh, on this uh, surface uh, surface of the sphere it can move along uh, any path on this sphere like like we move on the earth okay we can move anywhere let's say if our height is fixed okay this radius from the center of earth this is actually the radius x plus s square plus y square plus z square is equal to 1 so this is the radius of the of your sphere and if this is constant then you you have only two degrees of freedom you can either move uh, in any direction but in in a two it's, it's it will be a plane for 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 this point okay so only two degrees of freedom it will have it cannot change its radius the sphere cannot change its radius okay so yeah so it means the radius is constant height is constant only the other two degrees of freedom are they are changeable so this is actually the implicit representation of a sea space for spherical sea spaces and as you can as you have noticed that this time we use euclidean coordinates for its representation but previously we always used the uh, latitude and longitude this explicit parameterization so for the sphere we always used the latitude and longitude for any point let's say point p we just def defined okay what are its latitude and what's its longitude and then we locate this point we said okay this it has a latitude value is equal to some angle and then longitude value equal to some angle and yeah so this is how we this is called the explicit parameterization the advantage of this is it has minimum number of coordinates for representation uh, this is the implicit parameterization where we use normal Euclidean coordinates but then we have to use some constraints uh, here the problem is we have more coordinates and also one constraint so yeah so this is how we represent our configuration spaces and notice here I will I will like to repeat it here notice that the shape of the shape of the C space again it's independent upon the coordinates you choose okay so it means that the topology of this C space which is a spherical C space it is ind independent from the its representation same spherical C space can be either represented by two coordinates or it can also be represented by three coordinates so it depends upon which method you use for representation okay so this we already so one constraint on three coordinates mean two degrees of freedom yeah so if you if a 3d space you have a point can have three degrees of freedom and then there is one constraint so three minus one is equal to two so total it will be two degrees of freedom 
So our representation uh, will continue and let's see what we have here. Okay, so here we shall see some advantages and disadvantages of a representation. Uh, the advantage of explicit parameterization is the minimum number of coordinates as we have already seen that we only need two in in case of spherical C space we only need two coordinates for representation and these coordinates are latitude and longitude so this is one advantage so only two coordinate coordinates are enough and what is the disadvantage Disadvantage is that since the topology is different from Euclidean space, the representation will have poor performance at some points in space. Okay, so the disadvantage of using uh, this kind of representation uh, is that there will be have some poor performance at some point in the space. I'm talking about the explicit parameterization. And what is the poor performance? The poor performance will be that the rate of change of longitude is different for various latitudes like they will change rapidly the coordinates will change rapidly it's not same for all the points I give example in a sphere like this here okay it looks like oval so we try to draw from the shapes so let's say we have a this spherical C space And you have these lines here we call them latitude and then we have okay the pen stopped working okay so these lines these vertical lines we call them longitude sorry these are called longitudes So the vertical lines we have here, we call them longitude and then you have the horizontal line and we call them latitudes. Okay. So 
Now the problem here is that as you see if we move from um, this region the region of equator let's say this is an earth and this is the center line is equator and if we move away from the equator to the north pole then you see that the uh, rate of change of these uh, these lines it's different and the coordinates change actually rapidly they are more faster here you see the coordinates they change slowly for example if you want to jump from uh, this line to this line here then you have a uh, specific distance d but when you have to jump from here point this point to here then this distance is smaller so the coordinates will become rapidly changing but on the other hand if you select a Euclidean C space where you have a flat space and your lines are also straight so the XY coordinates they will not change rapidly they will change smoothly irrespective of the region okay so of course this is not a perfectly drawn but for an ideal C space which is Euclidean and its representation is uh, also in wh what was the wait a minute what was the representation of the so we said that we have for the these kind of spherical C spaces we have their explicit and implicit representation first face is flat then we choose Cartesian coordinate to be yeah so this is the uh, we can represent it using Cartesian coordinates okay if it's flat and then we said if it's explicit if it's spherical then we can use either explicit in parameterization or implicit representation of the C space so in this case we have here when this it's an um, Euclidean space then we can use the simple Cartesian coordinates to represent it and so in this case we have there is no rapid change in the coordinates the distance from here in this cell here it's will be same everywhere I mean the distance will be same so the if you define it 1, 2, and 3, 2, and 3, 4, 5, so this distance will be same for all other y coordinates also. Okay, so the distance from 1 to 2, it will be same from uh, 1, 2, 3, it will be same for also other values of y, so it will remain same. But for for the spherical C spaces we have this problem that uh, this distance is not same and it changes rapidly and another problem is that we have the discontinuity uh, problem so the discontinuity of the coordinates that makes also the spherical representation or the explicit parameterization of of the spherical C space it's a little bit difficult because the thing is here the angles let's say this is the 0 degree and this is 360 degree and you see that after 0 then we have 90 degree then we have 180 degree and 270 and 360 after 360 it suddenly becomes 0 okay so normally in our normal world flat world which is Euclidean space it doesn't happen after 360 there is 361 
but for for the explicit parameterization if we use explicit parameterization so this we have problem that we have a discontinuous discontinuity of the coordinates so yeah this is also problematic and this is a disadvantage also so yeah so these were the two disadvantages of the explicit parameterization of our C space one is the rapidly changing coordinates and second is the discontinuity uh, the advantage of implicit representation is that it avoids the problem of discontinuity or rapidly changing coordinates but the disadvantage is that it is more complex way of representation okay so let's make it separate and then we can okay so the the problems that we have with the explicit parameterization that can be solved by using the implicit representation and these problems were that it uh, the discontinuity and rapidly changing coordinates so if we use the uh, implicit representation then we don't need to worry about this uh, discontinuity or rapidly changing coordinates and the disadvantage of implicit representation is that we it is like a more complex way of representation as I already described previously that for an implicit a representation we need three coordinates x y and z and then we if our let's say the c space is spherical and so the thing is then we we are now using three coordinates x y z and one constraint which is x square plus y square plus z square is equal to one so now we have three variables three coordinates and one constraint and total degrees of freedom of this uh, representation is two okay so that the thing is the advantages of the uh, explicit parameterization they are that it uses less coordinates only two like latitude and longitude but here we are using more coordinates which makes it complex so now if we have to choose between two representations so which one should we choose either we should choose the explicit parameterization or we should choose the implicit representation so I would say it depends upon what your requirements are if you want to use less number of coordinates then go for uh, explicit parameterization but if you want to be um, avoid problems of discontinuity and rapidly changing coordinates then go for the implicit representation so we shall all we shall go for the implicit representation and of the configuration space and yeah because it's uh, we we want to avoid the problem of discontinuity and rapidly changing coordinates
so we accept that we have to use more number of coordinates and also include some constraints but we want to uh, use this implicit representation of the C space so yeah so this was all about representation and now let's see an example in which we uh, we try to draw the topology and um, representation of the of our 2R planar robotic arm so first let's draw so this is our base link here and here we have a revolute joint another link again a revolute joint one more link here okay and so here the angle what we have here is this angle is theta 1 and this angle here is theta 2 so we have two angles and this is link 1 and this is link 2 okay so what we want to do is now we want to draw the first of all the topology of for for this uh, robot so how the C space topology will look like so to our planar robotic arm and here we can write it C space topology so it's C space topology will look like something like this so when this uh, the first link rotates so for this we can draw something like this for angle theta 1 okay let's use this ink to shape and then one more inner circle okay, it's not 100% um, symmetric but it will work out so the thing is here for the configuration for our robot let's start from here this is a center and this angle here it will be theta 1 let's say we have from here starting from here we have a point here on the so this angle here is theta 1 and the angle from starting from here so this is actually uh, uh, this these two lines they are like a pipe okay so this you can consider it as a pipe So we can call it as this one here. It looks like a pipe bend in a circle. 
So imagine a pipe that's hollow from inside and it is bent in a circle and connected end to end. Okay, so I'll give you example from here. So initially it was like this, a pipe. And this pipe is if you connect them end to end okay if you bend it and connect it from this end to this end then it will become like a torus it will look like this here okay so this is a bend pipe in a, the, the red color okay and any point on any point P on the circle okay is the is represent the point here point P here and point P here and this theta 1 is the angle of the first link and theta 2 if you draw theta 2 theta 2 is the angle from here to the this point okay so as your link rotate more on the as this angle increases this point will move on the other side of the surface of the torus so we can call it torus so the surface of the torus is 360 degree circular okay and this angle is actually theta 2 starting from here to 90 degree and then uh, 180 degree and then on the back side of it it will be uh, 270 degree so this is how it works okay okay so, um, we can write this also like a torus and which is t power 2 and this is equal to s power 1 cross s power 1 <clears throat> so we can write it as a cross product of two spheres two circles okay so this was a topology of your 2r robotic arm and now let's see how the uh, representation C space representation of a 2R robotic arm looks like the C space representation of the above mentioned to our planar robotic arm is this is how it looks like let's change the color make it green and then like this so on x-axis we have the angle theta 1 and it ranges from 0 to 2 pi theta 1 and on the y-axis we have angle theta 2 this also ranges from 0 to 2 pi So that theta one can go from zero
sometimes it works the ink to shape but sometimes it don't so now it should work but it's not working so let's draw the horizontal line no it's not working so we can choose another method we can just select the axis okay that looks pretty good so one more time here we have zero and here we have the uh, let's say we have here 2 pi angle and this is theta 2 here we have 0 and then we have 2 pi and this is theta 1 so so uh, it can range from the angle range from 0 to 2 pi okay and then this is for link 1 link 1 can go from 0 to 2 pi and also the for link 2 angle it can go from 0 to 2 pi so this is considering uh, when individual motions are carried out for example the lower blue line is when the uh, theta the the second link was not moving only the first link was moving so it moved from 0 to 2 pi but the first and the second link was always at 0 and this this blue this vertical blue line is when the link 1 was at 0 but only link 2 was moving from 0 to 2 pi complete rotation okay and what happens when both links are moving simultaneously so if your <clears throat> let's say um, if your uh, link 1 is at 2 pi and now link 2 is 0 so your point is somewhere here and once the link 2 also start moving so the line will become like this okay and what about if your link 2 was at 2 pi and link 1 was at 0 angle and then it start moving link 1 started moving from 0 to 2 pi and both will when both become 2 pi your this point will reach so the area the area within this uh, rectangle okay all of your uh, configurations will be within this area that all your configurations um, of your two R robotic arm within your within this area so any value of angle for example if your uh, link 1 is at pi and link 2 is also at pi, pi your this point will be somewhere in the middle here so this is the sample representation of your 2R robotic arm and here it is the sea space topology this is how it looks like a torus and if you want more examples about how the topology and representation of different systems um, look like so I will I shall suggest for more examples about C space topology and representation refer to the book modern robotics and chapter 2 2 and your know, the table is 2.2 .2.
So there you have uh, many different uh, systems and there you have also their corresponding topology, C-space C -space topology and the C-space representation. So one we have already covered and there is one example of a system a point on a plane and then spherical pendulum and also a rotating sliding knob. Okay, so this is clear, then we go forward and let's talk about uh, configuration and velocity constraints. <clears throat> Holonomic constraints reduce the dimension of a configuration space, i.e. the distance constraints between, between the points of a rigid body. So we already we already uh, talked about constraints and when we were talking about when we talked about the degrees of freedom of the coin or a rigid body and there we talked about the constraints. So what a constraint does, especially a holonomic constraint, uh, it reduces the dimension of the configuration space. For example, if your previously if your configuration space was uh, 2, 2D and if you put one constraint and then it will become 1, 1D. And the example we have, the best example is the distance constraint between the points of the rigid body. We already have seen this. Um, if you remember the example of the coin where we have calculated the uh, degrees of freedom of a coin, So we mentioned that we have here one point here, which is A, and then one point here, which is point B. And we said that, okay, the point A, the point A has, uh, if let's say it's a 2D, if it's a 2D system, let's say a coin on a table, okay? So Y and X. So if your if it's a 2D, a point on this kind of uh, tape uh, coordinate system, it will have two degrees of freedom. Okay, and point B is at a fixed distance of, from point A, so this is a constraint here because B cannot move away from from the point A. It it must always be at at a fixed distance from point A. So because this coin is a rigid body, this coin is a rigid body, it cannot be deformed, it cannot be displaced, sorry, it cannot be twisted or deformed. So all the points on this coin, they are at a fixed distance from each other, okay? So here we call this distance D as a constraint. Now, once you have this constraint, B only have now one degree of freedom, okay? Because it has one constraint. So we already know that degree of freedom is equal to freedoms, freedom of point, minus, constraints so this is how we calculate the degrees of freedom um, so if B has total two freedoms and one constraint then it will have only two minus one one degree of freedom okay so yeah so these types of constraints that reduce the dimension of the of your configuration space we call them holonomic constraints, okay, because they reduce the dimension, they reduce the number of coordinates. The other types of constraints, they are called the non-holonomic constraints, and they reduce the dimension of the feasible velocities, okay. 
and the example is a coin rolling on the table or a plane they are sometimes also called velocity constraints Okay, let's see an example of a coin again and let's try to understand what are the non honolomic constraints so here we have a coin and let's say these are our axes here this is the x-axis this is the y-axis and this is the z-axis and let's say this is y-axis and z-axis here so here we have a coin and okay let's make it a little bit lower so we can say that it's touching on the table so let's say this is a table 2d make it a little bit bigger so this is a table let's say a 2d a plane and here we have a coin on this plane it's touching at point point let's say x uh, the point p with coordinates x and y okay so on the table the point of contact between the coin and the and the table or the plane is point p and its coordinates are x and y the angle the angle at which the the at which this coin is about its axis so let's say this angle is call it angle theta okay so this angle is the angle that's angle of revolution of this coin is theta and the angle uh, in which the, the this coin is moving let's say this angle we call angle phi and it's also with x-axis let's say if it's moving in here and this is your x-axis here and this angle is we call phi so this angle is phi so now we have two angles here one angle defines the rotation of the coin about its axis and the second uh, angle is phi which defines the the direction of motion of this coin which uh, or you can say the rotation about z axis okay so the idea is that if if as we increase this angle which is about z-axis let me make here z-axis so this is z-axis so this when the coin rotates about z-axis okay and then it's correspond to this angle phi and when this uh, when this coin rotates about about its central axis which is uh, in same direction as of y-axis but a little bit biased so then this angle will be theta so the idea is that um, this uh, this coin cannot have velocities about certain axes so the, the velocity of this coin is constrained along certain axes uh, if we notice that here 
the coordinates of this so the coordinates that define the configuration of the coin are so these coordinates are x y theta and phi so these four coordinates can be used to define the uh, configuration of this coin so the thing is now this coin can have when it's moving forward let's say in this direction in the in direction of this arrow um, so it will have a rotational velocity okay about the about uh, y-axis you can call it about y-axis it can have rotation okay um, but it cannot have rotation about um, x-axis so for a specific angle phi so this coin can have um, can have a velocity about in a, in, in a certain fixed axis along a fixed axis okay so it means that the for a for a specific value of phi its velocity is constrained in other axes okay so here we call them as velocity constraints or non holonomic constraints in which we say that the coin cannot have a velocity uh, uh, in in a certain axis unless we change the unless we change its angle phi okay so if you want to change the rotation of the of this coin about certain axis so first you need to change the rotation of this angle phi so this is a problem if you see in the real world also we talked about in the first lecture if you remember we talked about some uh, robots like omniwheel robots that can move in any direction instantaneously uh, so because they used to have omni wheels so they can change their direction instantaneously um, but then we have cars like your automobiles and there you cannot change the direction instantaneously first you need to rotate the four, uh, front wheels and even then it cannot turn quickly you have to make a round trip like make a circle to change the direction so here we have same thing here so here you can see the coin cannot move along um, let's say along y-axis if if the for a specific value of phi if the direction if, if already moving in this direction so it cannot start moving in y direction you got my point if this coin is already moving along x-axis it cannot uh, move along y-axis because its velocity is already uh, constrained and it depends upon this angle phi so to move this coin to the y-axis first you need to change this angle phi so this is called the velocity constraint or non holonomic constraints and yeah so the practical example of this system is your car or any kind of automobile where you cannot even even a bicycle is an example where you cannot uh, move to left or right side without changing without rotating the front wheels and making a circle okay and if you want to see an example of a system that's opposite to this that don't have any non holonomic constraints or velocity constraints the best example is a helicopter or a drone this quadcopter you see the drone or a quadcopter 
it can change its direction instantaneously without rotating just uh, you don't need to turn the front wheels and make a circle to change the direction so yeah I hope that this is clear if you have more questions feel free feel free to contact me or by email so or you can also join me on zoom so every Sunday at 1 p.m. okay so now we have a totally different topic task space and workspace are related to the configuration of the end effector of the robot not the entire configuration of the robot <coughs> so here we have let's say a 2R robot and this is the first link and then we have a second link here so here let's say we have an end effector and this is our task space or you can say workspace we have here so this is this uh, task space or workspace is about this end effector Okay. So the other configuration of the robot, uh, this is not included in this uh, task space or workspace. So we are not concerned about the configuration of the robot. We are not concerned about this. We are only concerned about the end effector. Is it clear? So this part we cover in the uh, configuration space. Okay. And this part about the end effector, this we cover in the task space or workspace but they are not essentially same so let's see what is the difference between them the task space is a space in which the task can be naturally expressed if the task of the robot is to plot with a pen on the paper then the task space will be Euclidean plane if the task is to manipulate the rigid body then the task space will be the C space of the rigid body representing the position and orientation of the frame attached to the robots and effector as the name suggests task space is related to the type of task that we are going to perform okay so if your task is to let's say pick and place an object so if your task is to pick and place an object so what you're concerned here is about the let's say we have a rigid body that we need to pick and place so we call this Let's say this is our rigid body we have. Okay, so about this rigid body, we uh, what we want to do, we want to uh, pick and place this body from position one. Okay. 
and let's write down with thin marker so this is rigid body and this is at position 1 and what we want to do we want to place it somewhere like let's say here at this position 2 so now here the your task space will be uh, the C space of the rigid body okay so if this is a 3d let's say 3d so body then we have our task space will be the C space of this this rigid body in which you have attached the coordinates here x y and z so this one is a body fixed frame and then we have one more frame which is we call reference frame x z and y so so what we are concerned here is that um, we are concerned so this body can have how many how many uh, very uh, how many coordinates it needs to represent the position so its c space should have something like x y z theta phi and psi which are these are the rotations about x y z axis so three translation and three rotations and here we have the gripper that can grip the objects and in the gripper we also have we also have a, a frame here which shows its x y and z axis x z and y axis so in this type of application so the task space is purely about in 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 this task is about the uh, c space of the rigid body and as it says here uh, representing the position and orientation of the frame attached to the robot robots and effector so what we are concerned here is that we try to match or we try to adjust the end effector frame which is attached to the with the end effector so that it's perfectly it can perfectly grip uh, this this rigid body and pick it and then place it at this position so that's what we want here so yeah so the task space is about uh, about the rigid body and your end effector of your robotic uh, manipulator so notice that it has nothing to do with uh, your kind of your the configuration space of your ro robot itself it's only about the rigid body and the end effector so if we talk about for example here uh, this example uh, plot with pen or a paper so in this case you have a gripper and the gripper can hold some let's say a pen the gripper write down a gripper so we have a gripper and then 
we have a task space where, where there is a pen attached to this gripper that is used for writing okay and here we have on the below we have the task is to write so in this case our C space will be a planar it should be uh, Euclidean plane you can call it where we have x-axis y-axis here so so in this case our task space will look like this uh, planar rectangular uh, Euclidean space so yeah of course here we have also one frame attached with the gripper also so it can measure the uh, the coordinates of your final pen where it's being located okay tax task space description depends on the task not on the robot so it's all about the task what you're going to perform and depending on that your uh, task space will change if you change your task your task space is gonna change okay so this was about the task space and now let's see about workspace workspace is the specification of the configurations that the end effector of the robot can reach so the workspace it means that uh, your end effector how many positions your end effector can reach for example let's say an example of an articulated robot with six degrees of freedom so it means that this robot can reach uh, so an articulated robot or one Two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this type of robot um, with six degrees of freedom, it has a workspace. This end effector can reach almost. Uh, anywhere on this uh, around this uh, space so it means that its uh, workspace will look like something like a sphere around, around it So, so all these points here so all this space a spherical space Consider it as a as a bubble around your robot. So six axis robot can reach anywhere within this bubble, within this ball, or you can say within this um, sphere. Your robot can reach anywhere. So this is we call workspace. Notice again that workspace is related to about your the end effector so 
So it's related to it's about your end effector where your end effector can reach okay um, it's not about the joints okay so it's purely about your end effector so this is this is we call the workspace workspace is dependent on the structure of the robot and it is independent of the task okay so it is workspace depend upon a structure of the robot it means that um, okay now we shall see what is the workspace a workspace is a specification of the configurations that the end effector of the robot can reach so in the workspace what we do we we are concerned about the end effector and the positions or the configurations where your uh, the end effector can reach around the space of the robot so it's literally related to your positions possible uh, reachable positions of your end effector So for example, let's see a six axis robot, an articulated robot. So let's say this is the fixed joint and then you have the um, A rotary joint one, two, three, four, five and six so here we have the end effector okay so now if we try to I think it's a little bit bigger let's make it a little bit more smaller one two three four five six and this is your end effector here okay so this is your articulated robot robotic arm and its workspace generally its workspace looks like something like this so it means that this robot can reach all positions within this within this area of the sphere so this is a sphere call it a sphere like a ball okay and this is also workspace so it means that your robot and effector can reach any position within this area within this space okay so yeah so this is the end effector of your robot
and you see that we are now trying to we even defining the workspace we talk about the end effector where it can reach okay so if uh, this is clear then let's move forward and the workspace is dependent on the structure of the robot and it's independent of the task so this is I think a very important point that it has nothing your workspace has nothing to do with the task what kind of task you're going to perform okay it's only about the it depends upon the structure of your robot if your robot has a different structure your workspace will will be different for example uh, for a uh, let's say for a uh, Cartesian robot for a Cartesian robot with uh, three linear axes So these are the joints, the linear joints. So it has three degrees of freedom. And so these types of robot they have a workspace like a uh, rectangle so you can call it like they have a rectangular workspace or I think I draw it a little bit farther away So this is how their workspace looks like. So the point here is the point that I'm trying to make here is that your workspace is dependent on the structure of the robot structure of the robot defines what kind of um, workspace you will get so you see that the articulated robot and Cartesian robot they have different structures so that's why their workspace is different okay and task space has nothing to do with it so your workspace is not dependent upon your tasks 
the kind of task you're going to perform. So these two are independent of each other. Okay, so the next point is task space and workspace are different from C space. A point in the task space or workspace may be achievable by more than one configurations of the robot. And the point in the workspace is not the full specification of the robot configurations. So till now I hope that you started to differentiate between workspace and the task space and the C space that we have already studied in the previous lectures. So a C space, if you define a C space, we define it like something like this. We say, okay, C space is the specification of the all joint angles of the robot. This was theta 2, theta 1, okay, and we call it we call this uh, space where we define all possible angles of the robot we call this as the C space on the other hand a workspace as we define uh, first I also draw this robot I think important is so this workspace, this P space, C space belongs to this robot here. Okay. So this is 2R robot, it's a planar robot and of course its uh, workspace will look like something like this. Let's draw with some other color. This is workspace. And this is also in 2D because our robot is planar, robotic arm is planar, so this workspace is also 2D. So now the thing is uh, if you want to reach any point in the workspace, let's say the point is this one here where your this point P we call it point P here P point so now the thing is this point point can be reached using two configurations of your robot actually so one configuration is this and the second might be like this. You got my point? So it means that we we can reach a point in the workspace. Okay? Let's say the point was somewhere here. This point was here P. Uh, we can reach 
any point in your workspace by using uh, multiple configurations of your robot so for example this P1 it can be reached by when your theta 1 was uh, let's say 45 degree and your theta 2 was 60 degree with this configuration also and it, it can also be reached when your angle was 60 degree and your theta 2 was 45 degree and with do so this point P can be reached other either use using this C configuration 1 or configuration 2 let's say this is our uh, configuration 1 one and this is here the other side is configuration two so this correspond to here the configuration two correspond to a point here in your configuration space so now you the thing that we wanted to say that a point in your workspace and this is actually related to this point P is actually this point here in your workspace so any point in your workspace can be reached by multiple configurations of your C space so this is a difference between workspace and your C space because the reason is the workspace actually is not the full specification of your robot configuration it's only the configuration of your end effectors not the configuration of the joints I hope that this is clear and let's quickly move forward so the next is some points on the task space may not be reachable by the robot But all points in the workspace are reachable by at least one configuration of the robot. So again, I will give the same example. Or let's have a different example, I think. So let's have an example of a Cartesian robot where you have this is your end effector here and these are the joints which are usually prismatic joints so this is your Cartesian robot okay this is your Cartesian robot and now what we want to do um, at it has if you draw its C space it will look like sorry the workspace it will look like something like this So this is your workspace here. And let's say the task is to drill holes. So here you have the uh, drilling bit here. And the task is to drill holes here. So you have a rectangular workspace and with this kind of Cartesian robot what you can do you can drill holes vertically okay 
can drill vertical holes here. Now let's say your task changes. Your, now your task is to um, drill holes at an angle. Let's say you want to drill hole in a different your for example your uh, your object that you're working on it looks like something like this let's make it circular So this is your object or your on the, on an object where, where you have to perform some operations and your task is to drill a hole here which should be at an angle like this from here so your hole should go here like this not vertical holes instead at angle you have to drill holes so now your task space has changed and you cannot perform this action using this kind of robot okay because the thing is uh, Cartesian robot they can drill vertically but they cannot drill at an angle okay if they cannot drill holes vertic uh, horizontally or at an angle so so that's what we are hearing we are trying to say here that some points on the task space may not be reachable by the robot so this is the point actually uh, in your task space which cannot be performed by this robot okay but all points in the workspace are reachable by at least one configuration of the robot so in the workspace here all points can be reached by this uh, end effector in this rectangular workspace all point this end effector can reach all points everywhere on this rectangular workspace but it cannot reach at this point where you have a tilted or tilted or angled hole so this we it cannot reach by this robot so that's what it's, it's trying to say okay now moving quickly forward two mechanisms with different C spaces may have the same workspace for example the planar 2R open chain robot and the planar 3R open chain have the same workspace despite having different C spaces. So it means that we um, even we have if we have two different robots they might have the same workspace their workspace may look like same but uh, or even if they have different C spaces and the example is here um, a planar 2R open chain robot so let's draw it here one revolute joint here and this is second revolute joint and this is we have end effector here okay 
Uh, so if we draw if we draw it workspace it will look like something like this Okay, this is the workspace. Of your this is a planner. Okay. And now let's um, let's draw the the uh, the three R open chain robot. So if we draw a three R open chain robot, its workspace will also look like same. Well, so we can draw it here. I think we can draw it like this here. So from here we can draw. Okay, we draw like this. This is your one. This is your here. First joint, second joint. This is third joint. One, two, three. One, two, this is three, and then you have your end effector here. Okay, now see the this increasing the number of revolute joints, okay, by one more, it will not uh, change the workspace unless you change the whole structure of the robot increasing one revolute joint it will not change the workspace the the positions where this end effector can reach the red color robot same position can be reached by using the end effector of the black robot okay the only difference between two of them is that now they have um, different they will have different configuration spaces so their C space will differ now the C space of your this 2R robot it will look like something like this where you have theta 1 theta 2 okay whereas the C space of your this black robotic arm it will look like something like this This is theta 1, theta 2, and this is theta 3. Because you have three joints, three revolute joints here. C space, okay.
Okay, so this C space is for this 3R robot and this C space is for 2R robot. And look, they are different. They have a different shape. This is different, this is different, but they have almost same types of uh, same workspace. Okay, so that's that was the point that workspaces can be same, but C spaces might not every time same. Okay, so the last point is two mechanisms having same C spaces may have different workspaces. This can also be, I think, elaborated using an example. Let's say we have a robot, a 2R planar robot. And and this is the end effector. So its C space will look like something like this. Sorry, not C space, workspace. So two R planar robot. And now let's draw uh, another robot. So it's, uh, for a 2R robot, the configuration space looks like, C space looks like this. Let me draw it. It's like here. Where theta 1, theta 2, and then you have some area where your all angles are given. So this is C space of 2R robot. Okay, now let's imagine again a 2R robot, but this time we have the a little bit different think I need two. I need some more space so let's move them a little bit closer yeah now it looks better Okay, so so this is again a 2R planar robot, but their links has different length. Okay, and I think I draw it a little bit bigger. Um, Let's do it like this. So 
so their links have different lengths okay but both are two are robot so now its workspace will look like something like this No, it's not that near. So this is also workspace. You see that both of the robots they have um, same. This is also a two R planar robot. So see that both robots have same kind of. Uh, structure their geometries their joints are same and their sorry the structure is not same but their C space is same they have both two revolute joints and their C space looks like both same but they uh, they have different looking workspaces because the link lengths are not same they have different you can call it structure so that's why their workspaces are not same. So this was the last point of this lecture. Yes. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me by email or you can also join me every Sunday at 1 p.m. on Zoom. We can discuss, we can we can solve if you have any problems and so we shall now end this lecture thank you very much for listening bye